Hello, everybody. Hopefully everybody's doing well. Good evening. Good evening. We are back. Welcome back to the Urban Consulate. I'm so excited to see everyone here in attendance. I want to welcome our uh, audience in Zoom. I also want to welcome our Facebook Live audience. So good to see everybody. Listen, um, my mother taught me a long time ago that when you walk into a room, you, you got to speak, you got to say something. So for those of us here in the Zoom chat, and even on Facebook, if you are here, can you let us know that you're here? Say something. Let us know where you are uh, tuning in from. Where are you from? Uh, if, if I know that most of us are probably from the city. What side of town are you from? You know, we like to do that thing in Detroit. Um, I see Bethany Howard. Good evening. Good evening, Bethany. Eastside, baby. That's where I'm from. Love to see it. I love to see it. Hamilton. Uh, Rachel from Hamilton is here. Let me put on my glasses. Oh, gosh. Now I feel old. Uh, Donna Givens Davidson is here from the east side. New center area, Michaela. Hey, Michaela. Good to see everybody. Hi, Rachel. Yeah. Ashley, we got somebody here from the Bay Area. That's what's up. Taryn, I hope I said your name correctly, from Cleveland. It's good to see you. Uh, Jessica from A2, Ann Arbor. Welcome. Welcome to Urban Consulate. Cincy is in the building. What's up, Rashida? Uh, oh, Detroit Hives is here. Every, yes, we are having a wonderful evening in Detroit Hives' is housed on the east side. We got some folks from Ann Arbor. Hey, Marina. College Hill. Hey, Angie. Uh, Boston Edison. Dominic. Yo, West Side. Audra. Audra, my friend is here. What up, though? Uh, Lucy from Long Beach, California. That's what's up. Somebody said, Gary, stand up. Jacob. Gary, Indiana. Wow, that's what's up. You know. How, how's the Jackson family doing over in Gary, Indiana? <laughs> Tuning in from Lexington, but Southwest Side Origins. Hi, Brittany. Nice to see you. West Side, Angela. I'll let you have that. Uh, Cuffy, the DMV area. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, uh, Christina from Washington, D.C. Happy to have you. Ali from Detroit. Happy to have you. That's, that's our partner and one of our Detroit um, Innovation Fellows. Facebook, what's good? How y'all doing? Y'all make sure y'all put something in the chat. Do us a favor and uh, share the Facebook Live if you're tuning in live on Facebook. We are so excited uh, to have everyone here. Listen, you still have just a little bit time, a little bit of time to go ahead and send the link to a friend that you know needs to be here. That's right, the friend that you're thinking of right now, go ahead and send them the link so that they can become a part of this amazing conversation that we're getting ready to have. So once again, I want to welcome everyone. We're so excited that you're here for an interactive, an interactive conversation we've been wanting to have for a long time, energy, environment, and racism. How can we work together toward a more just and equitable future? Thanks to DTE Energy for supporting this conversation so it can be free and open to all of you. This topic is timely as a draft UN report was just leaked, just leaked uh, this morning, warning that dangerous climate crisis thresholds will hit sooner than fear. Species ex ex extinction, uh, widespread disease, unlivable heat, ecosystem collapse, and other climate impacts are accelerating. The choices societies make now will determine whether our species thrives or simply survives as the 21st century unfolds, says the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We are gathering here tonight to drill down on environmental equity in Black and Brown communities. Specifically, tonight we're going to hear from our guest experts. Then we want to hear your voice as we explore some questions together. How can we hold ourselves and others accountable for achieving climate and energy justice in Black and Brown communities? What are some things we can do in our spheres of influence today? We are thrilled to welcome special guests, Dr. Tony G. Reams, and a newly appointed senior advisor to the U.S. Department of Energy and director of the Urban Energy Justice Lab and assistant professor at University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability, and Dr. Jalan L. White Newsom. She's CEO founder of Empowering a Green Environment and Economy, LLC. We're also delighted to partner tonight with Detroit Hives. Yes, 
a Black-led social enterprise transforming vacant lots into pollinator-friendly spaces. For every guest here tonight, we'll make a donation to support their good work. So thank you for coming. They're always doing beautiful things. Follow them and support them at Detroit Hives or go to their website at DetroitHives.org. Now, about our guest. Dr. Tony G. Reams was recently named Senior Advisor to the Biden Harris Department of Energy, responsible for exactly what we're talking about tonight, ensuring energy investments and benefits reach frontline and communities of color. He is an assistant professor in the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability and director of the Urban Energy Justice Lab. He is also a Harvard University T.H. Chan School of Public Health, JPB Foundation Environmental Health Fellow, and a University of Pennsylvania Clean Climate, excuse me, Center for Energy Policy Visiting Scholar. He has a PhD in public administration from the University of Kansas, a Master of Engineering Management from Kansas State University, and a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Dr. Reams' research investigates the fair and equitable access to affordable, reliable, clean energy, and explores the production and persistence of energy disparities across race, class, and place. He is a licensed professional engineer and has worked in both the public and private sectors. Dr. Reams is a U.S. Army veteran, reaching the rank of Captain, Captain Reams. Captain Dr. Reams has been named to the GRIST 50 Fixers list, Midwest Energy News 40 Under 40, and Oakland County, Michigan Elite 40. He was appointed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer to the Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice and to the Governor's Climate Justice Brain Trust. Dr. Reams, welcome to the consulate. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Orlando. I'm so happy to have you. I want to introduce now a lifelong learner and advocate, Dr. Jalan L. White Newsom, founded Empowering a Green Environment and Economy LLC, a strategic consulting firm with a mission to develop solutions centered around people to create resilient and healthy communities. She serves her clients with forward thinking and intersectional approaches to tackling issues such as climate change, public health, environmental injustice, and advise, advancing racial equity within institutions. Jalan has multi-sector experience having worked in environmental philanthropy, state government, nonprofit, grassroots, academia, private industry. Most notably, she created and implemented the Transformational Climate Resilient and Equitable Water Systems Cruise Initiative at the Kresge Foundation as a senior program officer. Wow, she was the first director of We Act for Environmental Justice's Federal Policy Office, Office in Washington, DC, and her doctoral research illuminated the impact of climate change and extreme heat on the low-income elderly in Detroit, and is still referenced to drive public health interventions. A native of Detroit, July earned a PhD in Environmental Health Sciences from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, a master's degree in Environmental Engineering from Southern Methodist University, and a bachelor's degree in Chemical Engineering from Northwestern University. She has recently completed a certificate in Diversity and Inclusion from Cornell University. We got Harvard and Cornell in the building tonight. She continues to share her authentic voice and perspective internationally by way of speaking engagements and board service to the American Geophysical Union, the National Academies of the Sciences, the National Institutes of Health, and the Minerva Education and Development Foundation, a Detroit-based African-American woman-led foundation. She is a professional lecturer in the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University and also a lifetime member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Dr. Jalan has been recognized for her work and impact by a range of organizations, including the Environmental Protection Agency, Grist Magazine, Michigan League of Conservation Voters, and had been featured by CBS This Morning News and Next City Magazine for her work on climate change, water equity, race, and mental health. I hope I embarrassed the both of you. Uh, in a great deal by reading your bios. We'll hand the mic over <laughs> to Dr. Reams and Dr. White, whom I will call Tony uh, and Jalan for the rest of tonight's programming with their permission. Don't y'all go calling them Tony. 
um, and Jalon. Y'all put that put some respect on their names and titles. Uh, but we're going to turn it over to the two of them for some opening remarks to lay the groundwork for why we're here tonight to hear where we are today as a city and nation on energy and climate equity and how they're each advancing solutions in their own work. Dr. Reams. All right, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Orlando. Uh, thank you and the Urban Consulate for putting this event together tonight and uh, really excited to get this conversation started um, and talking about energy justice. Um, I'm speaking in my former role as a professor, um, but it ties directly to what I'll be doing um, in the Department of Energy. Uh, today was my fifth day uh, at DOE, and um, let me just say it has been very um, overwhelming, but I am honored uh, to be in this role. Um, so I guess what I would do just um, in the time that I have, um, is kind of walk people through the journey of um, how I got into this work um, and kind of what the work we've been doing at the University of Michigan and kind of how I plan to take that um, to the federal level. <clears throat> so back in 2015, I started the Urban Energy Justice Research Group, um, which is now the Urban Energy Justice Lab, um, as a way to kind of brand uh, my research that I was doing at University of Michigan, as well as create an intellectual home uh, for students that were interested in this intersection of energy and equity. Um, and then also to provide a, a resource hub for communities and other energy stakeholders um, in their efforts to push this idea of energy justice. Uh, and I began this work back in the last economic recession. Um, so President Obama was in office and really thought about the environment and energy as a way to bring us out of the recession. Um, and so I started doing some research on our project in Kansas City, Missouri, that was called the Green Impact Zone. Yeah. So that will get us in this conversation about a place-based, community-based approach um, to the environment, energy, um, and climate. Um, and the idea was to bring in different um, earmarks for funds to uh, concentrate it in one community. And so uh, the Green Impact Zone focused on five um, co-located neighborhoods and brought in about $200 million of public and private investment. Um, and a big focus of that was on renovating homes, introducing renewable energy, doing energy efficiency. Um, and so I started doing interviews with some of the residents in the Green Impact Zone just to understand if you know, they <clears throat> connected what they were participating in to the environment, to climate change. Um, and I remember one grandmother telling me a story. And she said, when I see the utility truck roll down my road um, or my street, my heart rate goes up. And I asked her to tell me a little more, you know, what do you mean? And she was like, even if I had paid my bills, um, I was still worried because they were either going to shut off my neighbor um, and that means I would have to store their groceries in my refrigerator, run an extension cord, um, let them come over to my house at night. And so that really showed me this um, connection between energy, affordability, community um, that has really been kind of the foundation of my work. And so what is this idea of energy justice? It's really um, standing on the shoulders of the long-standing environmental justice research of the 80s and activism of the 80s that allows us to explore energy disparities across race, um, socioeconomic groups, and geography. And it really applies the principles of justice to you know, what some people call the energy oppressed poor, um, connects it to health and well-being, and really tries to get us to a system that fairly disseminates both the benefits and the cost of our energy systems. Um, and that's a big part of the new job that I'm in with the president's commitment to uh, what they call Justice 40, 40% 40 of all clean energy um, investment benefits going to environmental justice or other categorized disadvantaged communities. And so the idea is that we create a system where um, nobody is overly burdened everybody receives benefits from our energy system. When I started this work, um, there wasn't a lot of research that connected energy and race, um, but there was one very foundational report from the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation um, that came out in 2004, back when we were considering whether we were gonna put a price on carbon. Um, and so the CBC wanted to explore how that would impact black households. Uh, and that report starts with a very a fundamental quote that I always use when I'm talking to people about this topic. And it says where US energy policy is concerned, 
African Americans are the proverbial canaries in the mine shaft. And we know um, canaries were sent into mine shafts to you know, understand whether it was safe for miners to come in. And so you can look at a host of data. Um, and I'll talk about just a little bit here um, and look at the disparities and the implications for African Americans to understand just how um, unequal our energy system is. I often say we live in the United States of energy and security. Uh, many of us remember the massive power outages in Texas earlier this year during the winter, you know, thinking about how can the, the most energy rich, energy producing state in our nation fail so miserably when it comes to their energy system, seeing millions of households without electricity, people freezing in their homes, um, some people actually lost their lives. We know that throughout this pandemic, people are racking up massive utility debt. So what do we do there? You know, a lot of people are going to be, you know, out of power if we resume utility shutoffs. And again, this is very deadly, right? We we have stories of, you know, even here in Detroit on the west side uh, last year, a mother and her son found dead in their coal home. Um, and so this this idea of access to energy and electricity, natural gas, um, can be deadly. And those disparities are not equal, right? Um, we know that Black households, um, a greater share of Black households are experiencing past due bills, experiencing shut off, the same thing for our Latinx brothers and sisters and our Indigenous uh, brothers and sisters are also suffering from not even having access in some places to having massive utility bills. And so when we look at this, um, and I know we'll have a little conversation here later about kind of the, the spatiality of this, um, Shalanda Baker, who's the current Deputy Director of Energy Justice at Department of Energy, um, released a book right before she took that position called uh, Revolutionary Power, an Activist Guide to the Energy Transition. And in one part of the book, she says, the energy system routinely sacrifices brown, black, and indigenous bodies to keep the lights on for the majority. Um, and you know, and that, that quote really sticks with me because we've done some research here um, in Detroit that looks at you know, where our power plants are located and how that relates to um, who uses the most energy, um, who uses the least amount of energy, uh, what those community demographics look like and, um, and who suffers from the pollution from our energy system versus the benefits, right? And so we know where you know, down river um, on the, uh, in Southwest Detroit, where you have this kind of cluster of, of plants and um, other energy genera generating uh, facilities, but homes in those communities are smaller, people are cutting back because they can't afford energy. And so they actually have the least um, burden on the energy system. So they consume the least amount of energy out in the suburbs and other parts of the Metro uh, where they don't even have plants. People are consuming tons of energy, large homes, McMansions. Um, and so there's this benefit burden um, and balance that the administration wants to address. Uh, but you also see the people who can see the smokestacks, um, can't afford that energy, live in the least energy efficient homes. And so again, this major imbalance between who's bearing the burden of the energy system and who gets to benefit from it. Um, one thing we're trying to do um, about this in the Urban Energy Justice Lab is um, we launched a research project funded by National Science Foundation. So working with um, Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision, Friends of Parkside at Parkside Homes um, and Jefferson East um, Incorporated in the Jefferson Chalmers area to really kind of bridge what, you know, hopefully Jelan and I will be able to talk about later is, you know, a public health approach to accessing uh, energy efficiency and energy affordability. Um, and so in those three neighborhoods, uh, we're using a case management based approach to help people kind of weave through all the you know, crazy paperwork and you know, what documentation you need to show to be able to participate in a program, working with you know, the utility and with a lot of the other social service agencies um, to really streamline that process and to track people over time as they make improvements to their homes, they learn more about energy um, and just really say like, if we focus on this intently at a community level, you know, can we see massive change 
and transformation in those neighborhoods from an um, energy perspective, from a connection to climate change, does that then increase other environmental uh, related behavior? Do people start to build capacity for you know, different types of approaches to energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, working on energy democracy, taking control of you know, their energy costs and energy consumption? Um, because it really goes back to this idea of kind of knowledge about energy because it's so important and so critical to our lives um, and how that connects to other areas um, of the environment. And so um, I'm excited to have this conversation about um, energy, race, place, um, you know, how we all can get involved. And I'll make one plug that I will make again. Um, we launched a new project called the Energy Equity Project. Um, so energyequityproject.com, where we want, you know, community members, stakeholders from across the country to um, help us create a set of metrics that we all can use to first uh, illuminate these disparities, but then actually push policymakers, push our utilities, push our government to make investments in uh, metrics that matter. And then we'll track it over time to say, are we you know, hitting the mark or where are we falling short? And so uh, the idea is to get everybody engaged in this and um, to actually have some some data that we can then say, like, we're doing what we're supposed to or we're not. Um, so thank you again for the invitation, Orlando, and I look forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, you said a whole lot and there's so much to chew on and uh, to interrogate and question each other and question ourselves. I wanna bring in Jalan and give her uh, the opportunity to present um, her, her statements and uh, along the same lines, but maybe uh, a slightly different approach when we talk about um, advancing solutions um, in this work. Jalan? Yeah, so, so thank you, Orlando, for your no pun intended energy <laughs> you're bringing to this space. Um, thank you, Urban Consulate, for this conversation, the sponsors, supporters, everybody that's shown up tonight. Detroit Hives, who is a grantee of the Minerva Education and Development Foundation, glad that you are a partner and, and representing as usual. Um, I am typically calling from my home in southeastern Michigan, and which is it's seated, seated on the original lands of the Potawatomi. But I'm actually uh, in Columbus, Ohio this evening. So shout out to those folks that are in Ohio. I've seen some, some track in the chat. But essentially, I, I wanna acknowledge the land because as we begin this discussion at this intersection of energy and environment and racism, um, we cannot not acknowledge the original stewards, but also acknowledge the folks the legacy that, again, has put, I would even say, Dr. Tony and me and others in this position to try and make change in whatever small way that we can. So, um, but what I will say is I, I, I've had an opportunity to work in many places across this country, but I'm going to bring it home. And so even though I'm not physically in Detroit, I'm going to talk about Detroit. And when I think about Detroit, I think about riding my bike up and down seven miles. I think about the giant slide in Belle Isle. I think about the fireworks at Hart Plaza and the opportunities to see black and brown folks leading stuff, growing businesses, um, supporting their community. And that is something that has benefited me and benefited my family in many ways. And so I grew up loving Detroit and I still do. But unfortunately, Detroit has not shown that same love to many folks, particularly some of our black and brown communities, our low income, those that have been, I would say, in many ways, deprived of opportunities and access of basic human and civil rights. And so I'm not going to quote too many facts. I'm not going to show you a fancy slide deck. But what I want to do is describe to you some stories um, that I think, from my experience, speak to what the theme of this conversation is about, energy, environment, and racism. So when I think about energy, I remember questioning when I was doing the, the accounting for my grandparents who lived on the west side for 50 plus years, eight mile in Livernois, and their bills were like $250 a month for this little small brick home. And they were definitely on a limited income and I could not figure out why it cost so much to heat and cool this small little home. 
And much like Dr. Reem said, I wasn't only concerned about my grandparents, but I was concerned about their neighbors because all of the neighbors took care of all the children on the block. And I know that many of, I call our silver sinks in our communities, um, did not have a disposable income and were definitely put at risk. And that's how I got into my research on climate change and health, because I was seeing, particularly in extreme weather, whether it was extreme heat, whether it was blackout, that are some of the most, I would say, not vulnerable, but our communities that were more at risk you know, they were not getting the support, the resources, or even acknowledgement that climate change was an issue, that energy was a concern, and it was no resources out there to help them. And so I remember the blackout of 2003. I remember being in Chicago during the heat wave of 1995. I was actually in Paris during the Parisian heat wave in 2003. And you will see throughout all those cases that it's typically the same folks that end up suffering the worst. Oftentimes it's because they don't have the, the finances to afford air conditioning. And even if they do have air conditioning, but then also getting relief from extreme heat, whether it's trying to turn on the air conditioner or a fan or even open a window. In many of our communities, that is a security and safety issue. So when you think about the importance of energy from a public health perspective, particularly for those that can be more vulnerable during these extreme situations, it is critically important. So when I think about the physical environment, I think about when I was attending church in Southwest Detroit. And I remember always kind of, you know, being in amazement of Zug Island and the fact that this place looked like something out of a movie, like Transformers. The fact that you could accumulate so much pollution. And I have family and friends that still live there. And it's like, my goodness, polluted air, polluted water, polluted land, and families that have suffered sickness and oftentimes death because of a lack of environmental controls and justice. And as a chemical engineer, part of what I tried to do while I was working was not give the companies I work for an excuse because there is no excuse. But what I learned firsthand is that even our laws and policies and regulations aren't enough to protect certain communities because they are faced with multiple environmental insults, oftentimes not by their fault or not a fault of their own. So again, this physical environment and how the things that are supposed to protect us don't is, is something that I want to uplift as well. But then I think about racism and I think about <laughs> the pervasiveness of institutional and structural racism that has in many cases failed to deliver clean water to the residents of Detroit, but in many ways, many ways failed to manage the water that falls out of the sky. And, and we see that in the number of homes that continue to be flooded uh, in so many different ways. And the, again, the ramifications of that. And so for the past two years, I have tried to advocate and fight for my parents uh, who have experienced flooding four times in the past two years in their home, where the, our current utility has put the blame on them and many others and refuses to do anything about it. And so when you talk about racism and the lack of policies and practices that actually address the concerns and the needs of communities or make the process harder to even figure out, um, that is done purposely because in many cases, uh, people are not the priority and, and that's the problem. So it's nothing worse, I think, than loving something even when it's hurting you. And whether that's a person, an organization or a city or an agency, we need to do better. So these stories are my data. They're not isolated incidents. I could probably name, and you all could too, several situations that are aligned with what I've shared with you today, whether it's dealing with energy costs, whether it's dealing with extreme heat, whether it's dealing with flooding or anything else. And so I think as we talk about these big topics of energy, environment, and racism, that we have to acknowledge this intersection and that it's not only the power that's important that we plug in to get, but also the power that's held by, by people and privilege and institutions with privilege and how we need to begin to share that and disrupt that. And so the pervasive narrative that has always bugged me <laughs> is that black and brown folks are at fault. Like folks want to live in a place that's polluted, like folks want to live in a food desert or pay high energy bills or continuously experience flooding in their homes. And that narrative is so wrong. 
And the narrative I think that we need to begin to absorb and put out there is that to acknowledge one, that people are not at fault, but it is the systems that have failed them. So how do we fix the broken system? Some general thoughts, and we'll probably touch on this later, but I wanna start with the fact that as an engineer and coming out of Detroit Renaissance High School, Technical solutions are cool. I am a straight nerd. I get it. So whether it be the electric vehicle transition, whether it be fancy controls on the stationary pollution source, we have to understand the unintentional consequences of our actions. So we think this technology is going to be good, but are we looking at the whole picture? So we have to ask the question. The second piece, as a public health researcher and teacher, I share with my students all the time, we have to value all kinds of data. So it's not just the quality control data that we get from an air monitor on this side of the county that's not even in the part of the county where we need to be measuring, but it's also the data that we get from our indigenous brothers and sisters, the data that you get from living your life in the place where you are, that you collect the stories. And so how do we make sure that we value that and that it's actually used to create solutions that are going to actually protect and save the lives that we hold dear? As an advocate, I feel like one of the things that I have been fighting for is making sure that processes are transparent. (laughs) That is, again, I think a part of the racism in these institutions is that folks don't even know how to break the process. They don't even know how to leverage the process or understand the process. And so when you keep folks in the dark, it's hard to, to be able to think about like, you know, I shouldn't be living like this. So what can I do? The feelings of helplessness. And so how do we begin to enforce for our government agencies that you need to make a process that is transparent and that people can actually engage in if you really, really want them to engage meaningfully? And last but not least, as a mom, I know that what we do now and how we move forward, you know, we got to consider the long term effects on our children. So, again, I'm all down for solutions and and fancy technology and whatever, but we got to do an equity analysis in all of our work. So begin to ask the hard questions. Who's going to benefit? Who's going to suffer? And is there another way that I can do this so everybody benefits equitably? So in a nutshell, I love Detroit, but how do we help Detroit and all of the connected systems and institutions love its people back, most importantly? You know, we have to begin to address the root causes of racism, and we got to be smart about the solutions that we put forth. So looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Orlando. Uh, can we give up some uh, snaps in the chat? I don't know how I'm supposed to follow that and facilitate a conversation between Tony and Jelan after she just dropped the mic like that and did so in the most uh, loving but forceful way, a quiet force I would like to call uh, Dr. Jalan, listen, um, you know, this, this, this subject uh, has been a part of my work, especially when uh, I was working for Eastside Community Network for a long time, dealing with uh, disparate um, health outcomes in our residents because of environmental racis- racism. And I want to talk about that term. I want to lay a little bit of groundwork in terms of, you know, the language that we have been using tonight, environmental racism. Uh, to describe disparities in Black and Brown communities. Can you, first of all, just tell us, uh, Tony and Jalan, both from both of your perspectives, what does that mean to you? And let's uh, unpack it a little bit. Um, I really want to tip my hat off really quickly before you answer to both of you for um, not feeling the pressure to speak data in the white normative sense, but to tell stories. Um, and to honor the expertise upon the communities of both you work in. I really, really appreciate that. But environmental racism, what does it mean? And let's let's unpack it. Jelan, we can start with you. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, again, I don't, I don't know everybody that's on this call, but when I first learned about environmental racism is when I was working uh, as a, touch tech mentor at Dow Chemical Corporation, Dow Chemical in Midland, Michigan. And I was there to learn how to be a chemical engineer and all that great stuff, but I also ended up learning about environmental justice. And it was the fact that we were transporting chemicals across the country in these big trucks, and they were always spilling in low-income communities and communities of color. And of course, there was no data to really support that, but I began to ask that question. 
And then I went off to Chicago and I said, you know, for undergrad, I, I began to ask the same questions because you see on the south side of Chicago, folks dealing with lead smelters and all sorts of issues. And I got a chance to write an article and interview some powerful leaders over there. So that was my intro in environmental justice, the fact that for some reason, you know, certain communities, low-income communities, communities of color, our indigenous brothers and sisters, poor white people, and many folks were suffering disproportionately, meaning they were getting more, I can't even say their fair share, you know, and I hate that word, but they are suffering more than what you deserve to suffer and by no fault of their own. So it is environmental racism to me is the fact that the system, whether it be the education system, uh, our environment, the, the, the health system, things that are supposed to protect us, they fail us. And that failure results in the, the health disparities that we see. So the fact that our, our little brown children are dealing with asthma more than others, that's not just happenstance and anecdotal. That's because of the system. Um, the fact that we see when, again, um, some of my family were in the early parts of the, the pandemic trying to get COVID tests and they were turned away. Um, because, you know, it was an assumption that it was just a cold, but they were letting in other white folks to get tested. And so when I think of racism and the environment, it's broader than just the air, land, and water. It's all the pieces, when we talk about the social determinants of health, that makes certain folks suffer more than others. I really appreciate that, and I appreciate you naming that. Personal responsibility and forcing that on other Black folks and brown folks is not going to get us out of this mess. And I want people to get that. And thank you for naming that and making it as plain as possible. Tony. Yeah, that was great, Jalan. Um, you know, just like you, I was, you know, learned about it and went to an HBCU. So we, you know, we talked about civil rights and environmental justice in North Carolina, where, you know, some people, um, you know, credit um, North Carolina as the home of kind of environmental justice activism. So we, you know, learned about it um, as an Aggie. But I, I saw it firsthand. So I'm from a rural town um, in South Carolina, Bishopville, South Carolina, um, home of the Cotton Museum, the Cotton Pig and Festival. Um, you know, so that tells you a little bit about that place. But uh, majority African American, uh, low income, uh, but has the state's largest landfill, um, which smells, which leaks, and the state's largest maximum security prison. So two things, when the textile industry left my hometown, um, the county leaders who are mostly white representing a majority black county decided that was gonna be great for our economic development. Um, and because of those two things, the county still has a really poor education system, um, no hospital um, and very little economic development. Um, but my first job out of undergrad was uh, with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control in what was called the Underground Storage Tank Division. Um, and so my job as a project manager was to uh, try to go after uh, leaking underground storage tanks, so mostly um, abandoned gas stations that were leaking into people's groundwater. Um, so there were a ton of projects that were you know, non-compliant, nobody had been dealing with, and you can imagine where those projects were located. The projects that were cleaned up really fast were in the higher income, um, more white parts of South Carolina. And I noticed when I was going out to do inspections, you know, I would ride by, you know, you know, these country roads and um, people with, you know, really poor housing quality. And they all look like me. And they come up and say, hey, what you doing out here, man? What's going on? And you know, I'm like, hey, I'm here to try to get this thing cleaned up. And they're like, please, we've been begging, begging to get this cleaned up. You know, and people telling me about their water having funny taste. Um, and, and it was the, the, the state was allowing those project cleanups to linger um, only in communities where people didn't have the, um, the political capital to really make noise. Even when they did, they were ignored. Um, and so we see that play out in our energy system and the environment and healthcare and education, like Jalan said, um, we see it in economic development. Um, and there are people sitting making decisions um, you know, where you put a bypass, what communities you, you plow through. We see all this, you know, new um, renaissance about Black Bottoms in Detroit. Um, we, we, people just found out about Tulsa just, you know, a month ago. And it's like, but this has been going on for a long time. And so when I think about environmental racism, um, those are some of the instances that I think about. 
I'm glad you named that because I, I do want to talk very briefly um, about uh, spatial implications um, in environmental injustice and racism. And I want to key in specifically on, you know, where um, the, the policy inflicted violence, especially upon uh, corporate actors in neighborhoods where black and brown people live. Uh, we started um, an initiative that was funded by Build Health back in 2015 when we were still at ECN. And what we found out was that we were dealing with residents that had a disproportionate, disproportionate rate of asthma, type two diabetes, and heart disease in the 48213 and 48214 zip code. What's over there on the east side? Well, we got a chemical plant over there. It was proximal to the incinerator. And so I want to number one, name that spatial planning and corporate outsizing it is rooted in colonialism, right? When we talk about that, but also uh, the disparate effects almost always tend to affect people of color. Can we talk about spatial implications and corporate um, corporate development that doesn't benefit uh, that percentage that the federal government is trying to uh, get at, Tony? Yeah, there's this uh, so <clears throat> there's this concept in political science and public administration called the Iron Triangle, um, and it talks about the capture of regulatory bodies um, by uh, corporations. Um, and so we know that um, polluters are regulated individually, right, um, and does not account for that spatiality that you're talking about. Um, and so polluter A may be right next door to polluter B. Um, and, but when the government looks at how much the community that hosts polluter A and B is polluted, they look at those individual polluters and not kind of what they call cumulative um, pollution, cumulative impacts. Um, and people are fighting on the ground for that every day. Um, I sit on or sat on the Michigan Advisory Council for Environmental Justice until a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that's what we were talking about. Um, how do we you know, take the data, the maps that show where polluters are located, what are the impacts in the communities that are living around those polluters to really make a case for when decisions come up, when um, a company comes in and wants to get a permit. You don't just look at that one company, but you look at what's happening in the area around that company and to the people um, that are around that company um, to say whether you should accept that, that permit or not. Um, and so, this idea that we need to be more place-based in our decision-making. Uh, we need to listen to the voices of people that have been raising those voices for a long time. Um, and I hope we get to talk about, you know, um, like integrated resource plans and, and uh, groups that are, are pushing the utility um, across the state and across the country to, look, you know, look at just that, right? You know, it's, it's not enough to say, you know, this one plant is, you know, under the, you know, regulations for emissions, but, you know, the neighbor next door is polluting and, uh, you know, some winds on shutting down the incinerator in Detroit. Um, and you see some of those same winds in, in other cities across the country. Um, and so, yeah, this connection between pollution and place and the impacts that it has on people, I think, is a very important to talk about. Yeah, and as well as the policy infrastructure. How do we change the infrastructure of policy where, our government isn't constantly serving these large corporations that are violently killing our folks. Uh, Jelan, I wanna bring you in on this. Yeah, I mean, so many great things you said, Tony, um, but, I, but I'll just really harp on the fact that our, our brothers and sisters in New Jersey um, did pass a cumulative impact bill that gets at that, that no one lives in a silo. No one experiences just air pollution. We experience air pollution, water pollution, legacy stuff all at the same time. So how can you begin to, well, really continue to approve permits in a place that is already dealing with multiple environmental insults? And so that's what a cumulative impacts policy gets at. How can you actually say no <laughs> when you, you know, are going through your permit process that these folks are already dealing with 85,000 things and we don't need to bring in one more thing. So that's the first thing that I wanted to share. The second piece is we did a lot of work back in the day on this cap and trade policy. So this notion that you can have pollution in one place and pollution in another, but if you minimize the pollution in one place, then that gives you the license in simple terms to up your pollution in another place. 
And, and what that does is it allows corporations to literally, I would say, get away with murder. And having worked in industry, particularly the chemical industry, and knowing when I was working in plants in Texas, how close we were <laughs> to frontline communities, literally, and the things that they tried to get away with, and the considerations that were not made when they did plan expansions or had a release and all this stuff, those spatial implications are critical. And, and I would say, again, as we think about not just using GIS to illuminate these, these spatial things that we know exist, how do we use the GIS and the visualizations to actually take some action? So how do we make sure, and this is one of the things that we were fighting for, that, you know, in order for a regulation to go through, in order for a permit to be approved, you have to do, and it can't just be a check the box exercise, but you have to have some type of process that provides some infrastructure so this cannot just happen. You cannot just put another stack or increase the emissions without looking at, first of all, the legacy of pollution and disruption that is happening in the community, the current impacts, and then what this thing that you're propose, proposing, what it's actually going to do. And so that's where an equity analysis, when you're asking those questions, and it's not rocket science, it's just asking the questions and asking the questions of the right people and using all that information in a way that can inform a smarter set of policies so you don't end up, again, making communities worse off with a solution that was supposed to help them. <laughs> Listen, there's fire in the chat and people are anxious to uh, become a part of this conversation. I could talk to the two of you for 30 more minutes about all of this. We are going to have breakouts and you will get to talk to Dr. Tony and Dr. Jalan uh, in a breakout group. So we want you to stick around Facebook. There is a Zoom link in the Facebook chat. If you want to come in and become a part of the breakout groups, just click on that Zoom link to become a part of the, uh, the conversation on Zoom and the breakout groups. Really quickly before we break out, uh, oh, we, there are so many different kinds of people who have joined us. We have nonprofit leaders. We have corporate energy folks. We got people from academia and residents and things like that. I want, uh, before we go into breakouts, uh, you all to talk about what's the urgent ask right now? What is urgent right now? What do people need to do right now? And then we're going to talk about the questions for the breakout. Jalan? Oh, that's a big question. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> I guess the, the urgent across all those folks that, that you name is make sure that you are engaging the folks that you are supposed to be in service to. So whether you're a government, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're an academic institution, whether you're a private industry, you need, just like we do in spatial analysis of buffer zones, you need to look at your buffer zones. And you need to make sure that whatever you do is informed, it is shaped, it is influenced by the folks in your buffer zone. In a non-tokenizing way, in a real and authentic way, Dr. Jalan. Thank you yes. for that. Tony? Yeah, um, yeah, don't tokenize. Um, <laughs> I, I think the recognition that we're all in this together, right? Um, you know, there are definitely adversarial, um, relationships, and those are good because it allows people to say what they need to say, how they need to say it. Um, but if we don't work together um, toward a common goal, um, then that stalls progress. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, if we can all get out of our silos and talk to each other, come up with solutions, um, I think that's, that's a sense of urgency right now. Yeah. Listen, y'all, don't leave us because we're getting ready to go into breakouts and the conversation will continue. I see so many people in the chat uh, that I know it's going to add so much value to these breakouts. And so we want you to stick around. We're going to break out into discussion groups. So to join a breakout room, sit tight. Our awesome tech producer, JP, will move us all and then we'll move us back together to share out with the full group. So don't go nowhere, y'all. We'll have about 10 minutes for each question. And there are three questions. Here are the questions, all right? What is your role in environmental equity? Where do you sit in an organization or community where you can make a difference? Is racial equity prioritized in your work? That's the first question. Question number two, how can we hold ourselves and others accountable for achieving 
climate and energy justice in black and brown communities. Think about it. All right, last question. What is one thing that we can do in our spheres of influence today? Some of us have never had this kind of conversation. Some of us have not been aware of the spatial and violent and racist tendencies uh, upon systems and institutions in the United States that inflict energy and environmental harm on our most marginalized communities. Some of us are just learning about that today. And so as we are learning, let's also learn and figure out what we can do at the same time. Let's walk and chew gum at the same time. For each breakout group, there will be a facilitator. Uh, we want you to get right to it. We're gonna be back in about 30 minutes. So sit tight and our host, and producer uh, JP will get you uh, in a breakout room and we'll reconvene. So listen, in our candid conversations, really quickly, this is the ground rules or the grounding virtue, virtues for meaningful dialogue. Generous listening. Please be generous in your listening. We want you to practice humility and curiosity. You don't know it all. Uh, also, let's exercise radical truth with radical love. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great conversation. We'll be back together in 30 minutes for Share House and Closing Words.